Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Michael Walker, and welcome to our June monthly luncheon. Thank you for joining us today. And again, we're also joined by our virtual attendees as we're live streaming this presentation via Zoom. Welcome to all of those who are viewing online. If you're new, uh -huh. there we go. If you're new to Goma Greater Dallas, or if this is your first monthly lunch, please stand. We're so excited to have you. We have this year's group of building leaders here with us today. We are thrilled you're able to join us. As I call your name, please join me on the stage for photo op. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our building leaders, Kelly Butler, Jason Boyd, Ashley Watson, Jamie Vaughn, Maria Moreno, Morgan McCall, Courtney Bloom, Victoria Blackman, and Heidi Bass and Stephanie Fletcher are unable to be here with us today. Let's give this group a round of applause. That's not a good idea. Thank you again, and let's give them another round of applause. I would also like to thank our valued cornerstone partner, Mooring USA, for their sponsorship of this event. I see a few members from Mooring here with us today. Please wave so we can recognize you. We'll hear more from Neil Burden to Mooring in just a few moments. I would also like to recognize our 2021 and 2022 official partners. We truly value our partnerships with each and every one of these companies. And we appreciate your support of Boma Greater Dallas. Thank you to our cornerstone partners, Apex Surface Care, the Elevated Cab, April Building Services, excuse me, Building Services, AMST Elevated Interiors, First On-Site Restoration, and Mooring USA. Thank you to our Keystone Partners, America's Corporate Building Maintenance, Black Memorial and BMS CAT, Bridget Building Maintenance, Serve Pro Painters of Far North Texas, Citywide Building Services, Cotton Commercial USA, Glenn Companies, Promise Total Services, Reef Parking, and Texas Roof Management. Thank you to our Foundation Partners, Empire Roofing, Facility Service Group, Knight Commercial Services, Master Construction and Engineering, Select Commercial Services, Sun Commercial Roofs, Super Skates, and United Protective Services. Let's give this group a round of applause. Thank you to all of our allied companies that participate in our official sponsorship program. Home of Greater Dallas wouldn't be the association it is without these companies. We can't thank you enough. Now for a few announcements. Grab a cup of coffee uh, or your favorite cup of morning coffee and sit back and hear the latest advocacy updates from Bowman Greater Dallas Government Affairs Committee. The 87th Texas Legislative Session is wrapping up soon. Find out what happened in Austin during this unique pandemic session, including key bills that will be signed into law and how it will impact the commercial real estate sector in Dallas. During this virtual coffee and chat, for this, excuse me, this uh, virtual coffee uh, and chat is set for next Wednesday. Crystal Brown of Lockmore, Texas, Boma, Boma's lobbyist, will provide a comprehensive legislative recap. Advocacy is one of the benefits of your membership in Boma Greater Dallas. Take advantage of this opportunity Donating to Bowman Greater Dallas Political Action Committee is easier than ever before. 
Now introducing cashless donations. Simply scan the PAT QR code on your table and use your PayPal account to make a donation. As we can see, Jeff is holding up, holding up for us so we can find it on our tables. The Bowman Bear Dallas Political Action Committee is our local and state political fundraising vehicle. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jim Peck, a member of the Bowman Davis Bowman Greater Dallas Board of Directors, Government Affairs Committee, and PAC Board of Trustees. Jim is going to tell us a little bit more about our Bowman Greater Dallas PAC. Mm -hmm. Obviously, lobbying costs money and uh, getting our name in front of our local state and federal officials is very important. Um, so that's what our PAC does. We raise money for local issues for uh, support BOMA uh, Texas. And then we also have a separate PAC uh, for BOMA International to raise money for that. Um, as Michael mentioned on your table, you can scan your QR code and you'll have to take your money, donate early, donate often. Uh, it just supports a lot of things. This gets our name. Uh, by doing so, we're known for what does BOMA think about a multitude of items. Uh, and this is what gets us access, this is what gets us in front of those local officials. It's very important to donate to the local PAC if you go on BOMA International's website and donate to the BOMA International PAC. Um, it's really easy and it makes a big difference. And thank you for your time. Now, just to appease me, because I believe our BOMA PAC is super important, I want you to join in with me. And if you could repeat after me, say donate. Let's say donate. 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 I think we got it. This Keep us posted, Jeff, on how that materializes. The engineer committee is holding their second engineer session and happy hour of the year on Wednesday, June 30th at 9 at 3:30 excuse me, p.m. The topic of this session is understanding air purification utilizing lighting per ASHRAE. Come out for snacks. Dreams and a presentation by Texas Air Systems and UVR. This session is open uh, to engineers and real estate members, and there is no cost to attend this session, so don't miss it. Bowman Greater Dallas Clinical Office Building Committee is, invites you to officially, officially kick off the summer with the perfect venue to learn, network, and have fun. Join, join them on Tuesday, July 13th at Sidecar Social for roundtables led by only experts on relevant topics to expand your knowledge and help you be more successful on the job. Enjoy great food and play games with your MOB colleagues. The cost is $25 for real estate members and their guests and $35 for allied members and real estate non-members. Register online today. From June 21st through July 23rd, the Community, Community Service Committee is collecting backpacks and school supplies to distribute to the kids in need through numerous, numerous charities in the Metroplex. With your help, we can help provide students with tools they need to succeed in the classroom in the upcoming year. We have had great success with this drive in the past, so we're getting at, we're setting our goal at 1,500 supplies to fill backpacks. Don't forget to register your building to participate when the drive kicks off this week. Boma Greater Dallas is gearing up for the next Toby cycle beginning in just a couple of weeks on July 1st. The awards committee, chaired by Christy Walters, has prepared a website to help you make, uh, make the Boma process easier than ever before. This website will take you through the Toby process step by step with detailed instruction informative videos, tips, and tricks from past Toby winners. With this guide, the Toby process is simpler, so there's no excuse not to apply. Show off your building, your team, and your hard work by showcasing your collective efforts in the next Toby cycle. Call for Toby entries will be open July 1st through July 31st. After two years of anticipation, the long-awaited 2021 Foundation Gala is just four months away. 
and will be held on November 12, 2021. Let's celebrate that. Let's, we have been waiting for that for two years. Why don't we celebrate all those now who are working on that? Because we're looking forward to the gala and we're going to have some fun. Put on your flapper dress or your gangster costume and enjoy a night of dancing, food, drinks, and raffle prizes. Sponsorships for the 2021 Foundation Gala will be opening soon. Regist registration for the gala will be open on August 1st. Don't miss out. This year's gala will, will be one to remember. Now I would like to introduce today's luncheon sponsor, Maureen USA, and welcome Neil Burden to the stage. Neil just wanted to tell us a little bit more about Maureen USA and introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Neil. I'll hand it over to you. Hi guys, how are y'all? Um, I'm Neil Burton, I'm with Morning USA. Um, I'm gonna start by saying if you didn't get a chance to drop your business card outside, do it on your way out. We have a cool uh, Marshall speaker. It kind of looks like a Marshall amp and it's a portable speaker. Uh, we're raffling that off and we'll call or email whoever our winner is. So make sure you do that before you leave if you haven't. Um, I am very proud to be here today, and I'm not up here because I'm the best public speaker, but I'm up here because I'm very proud of the company I work for and of my team. Um, I have confidence in what we do, which is, if you don't know, it's restoration and construction. We are heavily focused on emergency services, like the ice storm that we all just experienced, and that was new for me to get to see it all and that's why I feel the way I do about our entire team. Um, so we have decades of, of history with this. Uh, here's what I want to talk about. I was in a luncheon in Austin last week and we were talking about what we do and why Maury and somebody said that they prefer a more family feel and a smaller company and I said well perfect and that's what we are. Uh, our team is like a family, everybody in the company, and uh, we treat our clients the same way. We have a relationship, and uh, when you need us, you'll be able to find who you need uh, one way or the other. So again, I'm Neil Burden. I'm part of the marketing team. My sales team is down here supporting me today. If you haven't met us, if you have questions, want to know more, come introduce yourself, come ask us. Um, I am going to move on to introducing our speaker today. Let me put on my glasses. Uh, I would like to introduce featured speaker of today's luncheon, Jared Fitzpatrick, with the Dallas Regional Chamber for the DRC. Jared Fitzpatrick is the DRC's Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or a DEI. In this role, he's responsible for helping DRC member companies be more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive at the board level, in the C-suite, and in their workforces. Fitzpatrick also works closely with the DRC DEI Council, co chairs, and its four sub councils diversity and leadership, education and workforce, community investment in undeserved areas, and policing and criminal justice policies. Fitzpatrick previously served as senior culture and human resources strategy advisor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Prior to that, he worked as a management consultant with PwC and Huron Consulting Group serving Fortune 100 clients. He's involved in Social Venture Partners Dallas, has served on the board of the Dallas-Fort Worth Urban League Young Professionals, and is an alumnus of the Dallas Mayor's Star Council. Fitzpatrick earned a diversity and inclusion certification from the Yale School of Management, an MBA and Master's in Health Administration from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and a Bachelor's in Psychology from the University of Houston. Diversity, equity, and inclusion have become top of mind in today's rapidly evolving environment, and commercial real estate is no exception. Jared will share his expertise on diversity, equity, and inclusion by discussing how the Dallas corporate community is tackling it, and most importantly, Gage, if your organization is meeting the standard. Welcome, Jared, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, it's always really awkward to hear somebody talk about you for a minute, but uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be with you all today. 
This is only my second time presenting in front of a group. And so this is the only suit that fits me now uh, after COVID. So um, I, I'm just, I'm rolling with it. This is like my one suit. Um, I, I wanna make sure that, that we have a little bit of time uh, to talk um, and, and for you to ask questions. So I'm gonna go through my slides and what I presented uh, pretty quickly. And then I wanna open it up to you all because this is a topic that I think each and every one of us has some knowledge about or has experienced personally or knows somebody that has gone through a training like this. Um, and, and everybody has questions. I still have questions about this topic and I do this every single day. Um, so what I'm gonna start with is just sharing a little bit about my story. Um, not what you, what you just heard about or not what you saw in the paper, but a little bit about why I do this and why it's my purpose. Um, so my diversity journey really starts before I was even born. My great grandparents were sharecroppers in Georgia uh, and Alabama. And they sacrificed so that my grandparents, my great, uh, my grandmother uh, uh, could go to school and become a teacher. She instilled the value of education into my parents. Um, uh, and so when I was growing up, my mom taught me that not only would I be going to school, um, but that I would have to work really hard because I was a darker skinned person and people would judge me based on my appearance or they even knew me. Now this is when I was about six years old. So I knew at that time that I wanted to do something um, that would help people that were marginalized, right? That, that didn't have the same uh, opportunities growing up that, that I did. Because uh, I think one of the things that we'll talk about um, when we talk about equity is this concept that not everybody has that same starting point. Um, and I was blessed to grow up in a family where education was not an option. It was an ex expectation. Um, but not everybody has it. So fast forward, I'm now in the working world and I have an opportunity to be in rooms where people are making decisions uh, that frankly, I was sometimes curious how I even got in that room um, because I was typically the only person who looks like me. I was usually the youngest person. I was usually the only person of color. And if you can imagine, so I'm in, I'm in a consultant and I'm in these big conference rooms with a big wooden table and there is a group of you know a dozen uh, people who are, are making some strategic decision about the future of the organization. Uh, and when I look around that table, it's typically all over white males. Uh, and so I knew that there was an issue, there was a lack of diversity that I wanted to do something about, but I had gotten so accustomed to being the only one or one of the, the few that I wasn't even sure where to start. Now, I will not tell you that every single person who has that feeling needs to go into working diversity and inclusion full time. You can make a lot of impact where you are now. But for me, I felt this strong pull to do something more because by saying nothing, by not standing up for people that traditionally not have a voice, I felt like I was part of the problem. And so I really realigned my career uh, and, and decided that I wanted to make it my life's purpose to create environments where everybody felt like they could belong, that they were valued, uh, and that they had a seat at the table. So that's really what I, I do every single day. I feel like I get the chance to do what I love, uh, so it doesn't even feel like work. But before um, uh, I, I came to the Dallas Regional Chamber, I used to do a lot of uh, speaking and talking with people. And the first thing that I would notice is that there was, if I was in a room like this, uh, with about 100 people, there would be 100 different definitions of what diversity, equity, and inclusion are. And oftentimes I thought, I don't think people really understand that they are very interrelated with separate terms. And so I wanted to start there today. Uh, and so the first thing I'm going to talk about is just the difference between diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, this is a diagram, some of you might have seen it before, that just shows graphically what, what diversity is, what inclusion is, what equity is, how they're different, um, what happens when you might have one or, or, or two, but not the other, uh, and then the outcome of having all three, which is belonging. So really diversity in, in a, a short form is just about representation. Uh, it's about making sure that you have different identities, <laughs> ideas, perspectives represented in a group. Now, one point that I always make when I talk about diversity is that a person is not diverse. 
I'm going to let that just marinate for a second because I often hear people talk about we have our diversity candidate or we have uh, our diverse department or we have diverse board members, right? When you say a person is diverse, that's really code for saying that they are not in the majority group, that they are other in some way. Uh, now a group can be diverse. We have a very diverse group of people in the audience today, but a person is not that make sense? No, with me? Okay, I just wanna make sure. All right, so uh, uh, the E in DEI, equity. Equity is essentially acknowledging that um, everybody has different needs, experiences, um, and, and started with different opportunities. And that, in an, especially in a workplace context, you need to create solutions and supports that give people, no matter what their needs are, um, an opportunity, right, to, to um, get the game, to have an equal play. Uh, and so I, I really just want to highlight for this one that it's identifying the unique barriers to entry uh, that some people or some groups may have. All right, inclusion. This is the one that people are really talking about right now, and I think everybody loves to talk about why well, I'm, I'm so inclusive. So this is creating an environment where people can be their authentic selves, where they truly really believe uh, and, it, and actually it are in, included in the decision-making process. Um, uh, that their voice is heard, that they have an, an opportunity to see themselves uh, in the organization. Now, typically at this point in the conversation, people are starting to wonder, okay, well, that's great, but why does this matter? Right, why are we even talking about it? Why has it been in the news so much recently? Um, so I'm going to talk about the why for these three things. So for diversity, uh, I'll talk about three main reasons why that matters. Uh, and I'm gonna break it down in terms of the actual numbers. So there's a Forbes article that came out, uh, teens that are gender, age, and ethnically diverse make better decisions up to 87% of the time. Does that shock anybody? Does that make sense? Yeah, it resonates a little bit. The reason why is because when you have people from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic statuses, different regions, they can provide insight into your customer base, into how you should be thinking about problems that when you have a very homogeneous group, you just don't get it. So you make better decisions. The second thing, more innovation. BCG, Boston Consulting Group, did a study. Companies with more diverse leadership teams achieve 19% higher revenues because of their innovation. So that doesn't trigger you to say, how do I earn 19% higher revenue? I got one more for you. A more profitability. McKinsey did a study, companies with more ethnically diverse executive teams, what you see with going up in the, the leadership ladder, are 33% more likely to outperform their peers on profitability. I, at this point, I, I, I want you all to understand that there is a business case for diversity, but if that hasn't sold you, then let's move on to uh, equity and inclusion. All right, so equity, the reason why this matters, um, when you have a more equitable workspace, you encourage all of your employees to increase their effort and participation. This should be pretty self-explanatory, but when employees believe their workplace is fair, is equitable, they're more motivated to achieve. They feel like they can earn more, they'll be rewarded more fairly, and so they give more to the workplace and to the job. The second thing, equity enables a future-ready workforce. Um, this is really focused around learning and development. Uh, it enables all, their work, all of your workers to achieve their full potential when you design solutions that give them the specific things that they need to raise, their self, raise themselves to the next level. And then third, and the one that I like to harp on the most, equity reduces employee attrition. So if you have done any of the, the trending over the last year, you've probably seen a lot of employees uh, from marginalized groups have been leaving. Um, and some of that is because of COVID, some of it is because they have to take care of the tenants at home. Uh, but a lot of it is that they're looking for cultures that truly make them feel like they belong. 
And I don't have to tell you the cost of turnover is very high when you have to retrain a new employee to do what that other employee did. Uh, you actually lose money most of the time. Uh, and so creating an equitable workplace helps to elevate the people who are on the margins to again have that equal playing field. And when they have that, they stay more. Uh, okay, so inclusion, better team performance and collaboration. The boy did a study inclusive leadership improves team performance by 17% and collaboration by 29%. Stronger decision making. Uh, in that same study, inclusive leadership improves decision making quality by 20%. And then higher employee engagement and retention. We just talked about that. So the outcome of these three things is belonging. If I could just highlight belonging in one nutshell, it's allowing people to bring their authentic selves to work. Now there's a distinction here. Sometimes people will say bring their old selves to work. I do not agree with that. I think there are some things that actually should stay outside of the workplace. When I say authentic selves, what I'm saying is you still need to be professional. But you can do so while being able to share who you truly are. All right. I'm going to go a little bit deeper uh, on diversity. Um, when we talk about diversity, people we talk about race, gender. Um, sometimes we'll talk about sexual orientation. Uh, in, in, in the more, I would say, progressive workplaces, you'll hear people talk about gender identity. Um, they'll often talk about disability, uh, veteran status. Those are the things that we, we hear about often you see in the diversity reports, but that's really just hitting on the surface. I like to talk to people uh, uh, using this diagram, which, which is commonly known as the diversity view. Uh, and so in that first section of the, of the or the first layer of the wheel, um, you'll see the, the primary dimension. These are the things that give us our unique uh, uh, perspective, and these are typically things that are new. They're things that you're born with, they're things that you typically don't choose or, or change uh, throughout your life. These are the things that give you your, your core identity. Um, when you go outside to the next layer, you have your secondary identity. Uh, and these are the things that, um, these are largely, I don't want to their choices that we make. Um, and so they have the, the ability to kind of help us to form our, our uh, external identity. Organizational dimensions, that third layer, um, is really talking about the things that influence who we are at work. Uh, and then that fourth layer, cultural dimension, these are things that um, might not be something specific to us, but things that are um, part of our larger cultural um, definition. And so what you'll find is that the things that we typically talk about when we think about diversity are really just within that first layer, but there's so much more that makes you who you are. Um, there's a common uh, uh, exercise that, that uh, groups do in, in leadership or training called I am not a model. And it talks about the fact that although you may look like somebody who uh, is in that training or you might have a shared commonality, you are a unique individual, and you have so many things that go into who make, uh, what makes you you. All right. Talk a little bit more about equity. Uh, who in here has seen this picture before? <coughs> okay, so this is a pretty common one. Um, the thing that, that I wanted to highlight here is that there is a core difference between equality and equity. A lot of companies do things that they think are driving equity, but it's really just giving everybody the same support, which is equality. Now, you can see in the picture that the people who are getting that support have very different needs. Uh, one is a lot taller than the others, and so they don't really need that support. Uh, one support is perfect for what they need, but then one person, even though that support is equal with the others, doesn't get from so really the difference here is that equity is providing support based on what people need. Uh, and it may be different. You may have to do more for a specific group. This is the diagram that I like to work off of because it doesn't just highlight equality versus equity, but it also deals with the underlying system. Now, when you talk about systems, these are uh, promotion, these are pay, uh, this is, you know, how you determine who gets to go to the conference or who gets that additional leadership um, uh, 
opportunity with the stretch assignment. And that's really addressing the underlying system and when we talk about justice. All right, move quickly here. So I'm gonna make this real for you all. I know you're probably tired of hearing me talk about just diversity, equity, inclusion in general. Uh, and I wanna highlight some of the, the statistics, all right? So this now did uh, a study in November of, of last year. They talked to 68 different companies and they looked at C-suites and board of directors uh, the, na the nation's largest brokerages, uh, commercial real estate investors, real estate investment trusts. And the thing that highlighted uh, the disparity most for me when I was looking at these numbers was that out of these 68 companies, only I put 14% of those with 13.9% um, uh, have people, uh, or, or excuse me, um, are people of color on their boards uh, of, of directors. And then when you break that down by the specific industries, you see the numbers really aren't that much better. Now, why did I vote this year? Um, I thought it was important because when you look at uh, each, for example, uh, out of the 26 largest, 8% uh, of our city board members are people of color. What that really shows is um, there is an intentionality that, that is has to be put in place when you look at your leadership positions. Uh, a lot of companies are doing a lot of diversity work right now, and they're trying to bring in more people uh, in entry-level positions, right? Creating these pipeline programs. But the biggest change happens from the top. Uh, there's a common saying, culture is the shadow of the leader. And so when you drive diversity from the top levels, it permeates throughout the organization. Uh, so, so in, in a nutshell, what I wanted to show you was that when you focus on board diversity, just like when I talked about diversity, equity, inclusion in the beginning, um, you are going to have better corporate outcomes. Your board is going to bring better and more unique perspectives, and it's going to help you remain more competitive here in your local market, but also nationally. Uh, for those who maybe aren't, aren't aware of this, there is a big push right now. Um, to require diversity on boards. 10 states have already formalized that, uh, and NASDAQ has a big push right now that if you want to be listed on their exchange, that you have at least two board members that uh, identify as a race or racing or ethnic or gender, uh, one of those gender diversity categories. So, this is something that I think is not going to be going away anytime soon. Uh, and it's something that I, I truly believe is a catalyst for changing the organization uh, throughout. I want to talk about just a few things that um, we're doing at DRC. It's one thing for me to get up here and share all this information with you. It's another thing for me to tell you why we think that it's important and what we're actually doing about it. Um, so you'll see our four categories or four priorities for diversity, equity, and inclusion at DRC. The first and this is not by uh, just chance. The first is diversity and leadership. Now we're doing this within our organization. So we did our first board diversity survey this year where we understood uh, all the different aspects of who our board is. So not just race, ethnicity, uh, and gender, but we're also asking questions about um, education, like family status. We want to know what your sexual orientation is. We, we want to know who we have represented and who we don't. What are our gaps? Um, in addition to that, we're putting out resources for our members to be more thoughtful about how they're recruiting, not just at the entry level, but also at senior leadership levels. How can you be more proactive about going out and finding board members that can really build those resources? Um, second thing we're touching on is education and workforce. This is really convening our businesses with university partners, workforce development partners within our community, and highlighting that there are a lot of people in areas that typically are overlooked um, that can do this work, that have quality education skills that just may have been um, underestimated in the past. Third thing, community investment in underserved areas. Predominantly, we're talking about Southern Dallas County. We um, recognize that there is a long history over a century of uh, institutionalized racism, policies, practices, redlining that have affected 
how our community is developed. We now have a huge geographic divide between North and South. Uh, and so we're not only investing dollars directly into community partners that are doing work, but we're asking our members and, and community partners, uh, nonprofits, to work together to think about how to raise our equity. Uh, and then we're also highlighting suppliers, minority owned, women owned, veteran, LGBTQ owned, disability owned suppliers um, who want to be connected to employers that either have a supplier diversity program already or are interested in helping to mentor uh, or coach them so that they can do more work um, with larger suppliers, but with, with larger uh, employers. Uh, in our fourth area, and this is the one that I will be very honest and transparent with you. It's probably the newest uh, to the chamber world in general. We, we've asked our chamber partners if anybody else is tackling this, and nobody else is, uh, is policing and criminal justice policies. After George Floyd, we felt like this was something that we couldn't stay silent on. So during the last legislative session that, that just wrapped up, um, we threw down several cards in support of common sense policing. Uh, more police accountability, transparency, uh, and we're standing firm on that line. Now, I'm not going to read through all of this. This is a lot on one slide, but I did want to just provide, for those who are more visual, kind of an overview of what we have done and some of the outcomes that we um, focused on. The biggest thing that I'll share is this is a commitment that we're not walking away from. Uh, in addition to having myself on staff, we have a DEI council, which is made up of a little over 50 of our board members. We have a hundred of them. Um, they've all raised their hand and said that they want to lean in on this. And so we would assign them or really uh, align them under one of these four areas. For the sub council, they meet five times a year. They talk about what they're doing internally. We talk about what we're going to do together. Uh, and then we go out and we make the work happen. Uh, in addition to that, we have a partnership right now with the Dallas Citizens Council and the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, focused on racial equity. Our goals there are really to highlight the disparities of numbers uh, in terms of the racial equity uh, gaps, specifically in, in terms of wealth and economic growth. Um, and, and then to highlight the levels we identify about 75 right now for companies to use in starting to close those gaps. Last thing I'm going to talk about before I open it up for questions is uh, how you can get involved. I get this question every time I speak. The one thing that I encourage people to do is, well, two things. Go check out our website, learn more about what we're putting out. There's tons of resources that we provide. Uh, every month we put out a resource for people to celebrate the diversity uh, within their organization. But two, uh, join us for some of our events. We, made an intentional focus on not just doing events where you get talked at for an hour. We wanted to do events where you would actually engage with other companies, other community partners who are doing this work. And so our uh, inaugural State of Diversity Act and Inclusion will be on June 22nd, next Tuesday. We're going to have a speaker um, coming from Brookings to talk about how you can go from commitments to action. But we're really focused on our uh, community connections experience which is designed to be a curated, safe space for community members to talk with businesses on whatever particular focus area that they care about. We have about 10 identified. Uh, it could be education, it could be workforce equity, it could be health uh, or environmental sustainability. But essentially, this is that place where if you've always said, and I, I really want to lean in on this issue, but I'm just not sure how to get started, this is where you start. So I'll stop there and I will ask if there's any questions about anything that I've shared so far or any other concepts or topics that you've heard about that you want to learn more about. All right, so <clears throat> I'm curious. Uh, how, how you think the best way to shift culture um, to a culture that's really trying to push and require 
diversity inclusion, sometimes just for diversity inclusion's sake. Um, away from, you know, not everywhere's perfect, but away from a lot of environments that are already kind of meritocracies, right? And so they're they're always going to be very qualified individuals of all sorts. But I feel like sometimes, and maybe you didn't correct me, I'm not your favor, but times where we're adding you know, requirements or or identifications, whether it be personal life, race, whatever, that maybe wouldn't be a question about somebody before, and now becomes a deciding factor on whether or not they're part of something. And I'm just, like I said, curious as to what you think the approach is on changing culture in that regard, because I feel like there's some some value. You said that you said there's a business argument for, for you know, diversity and inclusion, and that makes a lot of sense. But there's also a business argument for meritocracy. And I think sometimes, especially now, they can get heavy handed, and I'm curious, I'm curious about that. That looks like how how do you solve that? I, I love that question. Uh, and I agree. Um, <laughs> When you think about the history of, of this work, um, affirmative action was a big portion of why companies started focusing on diversity. Uh, and so sometimes I still hear people talk about what we're doing today uh, like it was back in the 80s and uh, early 90s, where, well, this person is start spoken, we have to have this quota. I would never agree with that. And so I, I think that when you start to make decisions based on the demographic factors, you have really missed the mark. I uh, will caveat that by saying that oftentimes the people who um, you're looking for when you're having the demographic factors, it could be race, ethnicity, gender, whatever, um, might have not been included in your pool to begin with because you're focused on uh, one specific group even though you don't think that you are. That's where bias really comes into the conversation. So when you talk about recruiting um, or even recruiting for board members, oftentimes you're fishing in the same ponds. Not because you didn't want to look at the ponds, but because that's your sphere. Right? When you uh, go back to your alma mater and, and look at the same groups of people that you've been looking at for years, although they provided a lot of really quality candidates, you're not recognizing that there might be another really great school that could provide the same quality or even better quality that you just never looked at. Um, when you think about the amount of people that are in your candidate pool for any uh, role, I wonder if you ever look at what is the makeup of that pool. The, 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 the people in the room currently know what your demographic makeup is of your candidate pool? Does anybody know? If you, if you just looked at a particular role, could you tell, I know who's in this pool of candidates? Yes? I think that's pretty rare. I don't think many companies can say that we did a good job of looking for diversity in our candidate pool. So what I would encourage people to do, um, and this is kind of getting into tactics and I'll talk about that as a culture, but ensure that you're getting diversity in your pool, but don't make a decision based off of it. Right? So um, a, a bunch of studies have shown if you have what the NFL calls the Looney Rule, one person in your pool, your chances of actually taking that person over the majority group uh, are really low, almost next to zero. But when you can improve your candidate pool to at least 50% of uh, whatever that diversity characteristic is, then your chances jump up 25% of choosing at least one, if not more, uh, depending on how many roles you have available of that group. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's easy to do. You're going to have to do the hard work of going out and sourcing differently than you have in the past. And it might require you to expand your personal circle. Right? When you're thinking about board members, you have to go beyond just the people that you typically talk to or that you go to church with or that you go to the country club with. You might have to go up and, and find some people that don't look like you or don't have a similar background to you. Uh, and then from a culture standpoint, to get to your, your question, I really think that it starts at the top. I think that's clear through the slides that I showed. It starts with the board and the executive leadership. 
the number one way that I've seen to change their perspective or to start to get more buy-in is by explaining it in a form of a story as to why this is important. Um, when you share a, a story from the perspective of somebody who has been marginalized, then you give them the experience. When you share numbers, that only goes so far. This business case is that I shared today is not new. It's, we've been able to prove some of this stuff for decades. But the thing that I've seen really shift people's perspective is understanding the experience that somebody else went through because of the fact that they were uh, marginalized or were, for whatever reason kept outside of those positions of, of power. Um, and so what I tend to use is uh, uh, there's a, a whole process that goes into it, but uh, just essentially an opportunity to share the story from somebody who is either that next level below leadership or if there's nobody from uh, a diverse background in that level or the next level. Uh, and if you can't find anybody there, try to find somebody outside of the organization that can highlight the importance to that person in leadership, not from a numbers perspective, but from a here's what I personally experienced, right? And that's when you start to see people change the way that they believe, how it change behavior, changes behavior. Um, but I think trying to, to hit at it is, to your point, heavy handed approach, um, or trying to hit people over the head with, well, this is bad, we gotta do better, immediately puts up that defensive wall. And that's not going to change. I have a question. You talked about um, our education is really large for you to join right now. Yeah. Um, so far, you know, kind of top down approach. How do you think you know, education is the key to success? How do you think you change the culture to where that's not effective to promote education? In both ways, two is not enough. How do you think you can push towards promoting education in the community where it's not cool to do that, or where it's cool to do this or that, but the things that matter, the things that employers look for, how do you change that culture to shift towards, hey, we, of course, we want to diversify, but we want to focus on that. What can you do in the culture? How do you think you change that focus in the bottom of the Okay. So I want to make sure I understand the question. So I'm going to ask it back to you. Sure. So you're saying from an employer perspective, how do you change the culture internally to focus on encouraging any candidates who might come from a background that doesn't value education? No, I'm, I'm saying how do we go to communities? How do we change the culture where it makes it like how do we get to go to school, get an education, do this right? How do we change the culture from the bottom up the stuff? You pointed out how to do it from the top down. It was very clear it benefits us, but you know, children on the future. So how do you, how would a company let's say start a program or how do you do it from top to change the culture to what's cool to start the next So a shameless plug for a program that we have at the DRC called Dallas Thrives, where we do just that. We work with employers to build talent pipelines uh, with DISD, with Dallas College. Um, with some of our four year institutions where they can go and they don't have to build a program that will do that part for you. They literally just have to provide the, the people and they have to know what skills and what jobs they think they're going to need going forward. And we will help them create that pipeline with the University of Workforce Development Park so that literally all you have to do is if you want to come into the school talk to them about what those careers look like, expose them to what that what the trajectory could be. Because that's where I see the biggest disconnect is, is that in some communities, you just don't know what you don't know. You never get exposed to that career, so there's no way that you could plan for that. Um, but also talk to them um, about how to build a resume, how to network appropriately. Some, some students that I talk to, they think the best way to get that job is just by applying as much as possible. Nobody's ever told them that you should be trying to connect with somebody who works there, who works in that industry and build your relationships so that they can help you. Um, we've done some, I've seen some employers do interview skills, uh, classes or, or workshops. It's not hard to do. It's taking a week, um, over time, you know, out of 
a year to go talk with your students. So I would I would say starting there from the employer standpoint. Um, the other thing that I would encourage, if you're not already personally, this is something that I I I believe, and it sounds like you you might be along the same pathway. Um, you have to do some of the work yourself, right? Of going out and encouraging that to happen within your organization. Right? So thinking about it from a bottom up perspective, um, you have a lot of power in your organization, no matter what level you are, because you can build a coalition. And so sometimes I've, I've seen the change happen from the employees at, at the bottom, building up galvanizing support around them and then bringing a suggestion or proposal to that senior leadership team to say, hey, I think that we should participate in at Dallas Mirage or, or whatever program or, or you know, activity you want to participate in. Uh, if you have employee resource groups, that's a really easy way to build that support. If you don't have employee resource groups, then sometimes it's it's you going around and building the support on your own. Um, but personally, that's where I've seen some of the biggest change come from. If it doesn't start at the top, that person in the team leadership doesn't already have that as a, a, a focus area, or something that they're personally convicted about. It's seeing that groundswell of employees saying, hey, we care about this and we need to do something. Another question or two. Okay. All right. Other questions? So, from an organizational perspective, looking at the presentation, specifically organizations are who they are, and they are what they can. But the information you're sharing sort of causes us to imagine what an organization can be. You touch on a few of those touchstones that sort of help set that vision for who you can become as it relates to what you have. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would probably uh, start by determining where you are. It, it's kind of like um, you know, everybody in here is using Google Maps, right? Or, or MapQuest or Apple Maps, or a, a software that shows you where you want to go. Um, you, you don't ever start going, you, you can't go anywhere until you type in your current location. Right? Like that's just part of the app. Um, and so oftentimes, especially within the last year, I've seen organizations just go. They get started, they set a, a DNI vision, and then they start doing trainings or they hire in a chief diversity officer, but they never actually spent the time to figure out where they were and what steps were needed to get to that future vision. Um, so when you talk about the milestones, the first thing I thought was, where are you starting from? Because the, the milestones that you set at one organization might be completely different from the milestones you set at another one, depending on where they're starting from. Um, and so that's truly what I would say is I would, uh, if, if you have the ability to invest in doing an EDI assessment or a cultural assessment, uh, there's tons of consultants out there. If you need recommendations, I can provide you a list of probably 25 or 30 um, if, with various levels, various price points. But I would start there. Uh, or if you have somebody who think an organization that that's their focus, then that should be something that they're doing. Uh, is providing that assessment to really help you understand where are you. And then at intervals, that's practice that I've seen is quarterly, um, but some people prefer to do it annually, really assessing how far have we gotten in this work, um, all under the, uh, the auspice of how to get to that most term goal. So I wish I could tell you that there were, there were set milestones. There's a lot of models out there. Deloitte has a really great model. It's uh, five steps. Gartner has a model. Uh, Corn Ferry has another model. These are all DEI maturity uh, frameworks. But the best ones that I've seen have been designed in-house. Um, they don't say, you know, you have to do this first. You have to have a compliance officer. You have to have a 
you know, a, a, a diversity recruiting plan first. Sometimes that's not the thing that you need to start with. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen some companies do a great job of recruiting diverse talent, but the environment that they're bringing in, them into is toxic. And if you have a environment that's not inclusive, it's going to be a revolving door, and you're just going to lose money. So all that to say, I would start first by understanding where you are. Set if you, uh, again, have already done some of this work, you probably have metrics that you're monitoring. If you haven't tried it at all, I would start with the data and understand what metrics are we going to be tracking as we go along, um, because what gets measured is important. But, but yeah, I, I, I wish there was a boilerplate answer. I can say, here's the key milestone you should be looking for. This, Truly different than the organization. All right, any other questions? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, you may uh, say something about how we, we can do things that we did to take ourselves yeah. and how it's up to us, regardless of where we are in our company or even personally. And uh, I will say to you that I have recently in the last six or nine months gone through a program through my church on the bridge. And uh, and it's a, it's a very diverse culture in our church. And it's learning what we don't know about people that are different than us. And you nailed it when you said earlier that you've got to tell the story. And I don't care what color your skin is, you need to feel comfortable enough with the person that you're working with, you're friends with, are social with, that you can say, let me tell you my story. And uh, and then on the other side of it, the person they're telling it to has to listen openly and not have to, don't get ahead of them and don't have to preconceive notions about where they came from and you know what their story is. You just have to listen to it. Because one of the things that I could say to you as a white lady that grew up in an all white neighborhood, all white school, all of those kinds of things, um, it was amazing the things that we didn't know about our sisters and brothers of color. And it was amazing how much they were surprised at what we didn't know. And uh, and I think that's where some of the tension comes from. It's the fact that there's so much anxiety that's gotten built up because of so much publicity about things that we don't know how to let our guard down anymore and just be honest with each other. What's your name? Linda. Linda, that's not to come talk to you. <laughs> that was amazing. I, I, so I, um, it, it's funny, I've, I've done some work around. Uh, um, really, how to effectively tell your story. And when we talk about building bridges, it, it made me think about this because what we call it is really building an impactful bridge, where at an emotional level, you start to bond with that person through the use of story. Uh, but I think you, you hit another topic which is really important, which is how you create that safe space is given to having a positive conversation. Um, I've seen people try to do the, the storytelling or let's have a, a tough conversation about race in a group setting, and it's been disastrous. So sometimes the best way to have that conversation is by bringing a person one-on-one -on -one, uh, aside, you know, doing an offsite, having a lunch, um, and really just starting with, I just want to know you. Right? And, and through that conversation, we can have further conversations where we talk about some of these tougher issues. But when you start by just level setting with, I want to understand who you are as a person and share your life, I rarely see people get defensive about that. Right? So I love what you just said. Um, I want to make sure there's no other burning questions. Let me get a short time. Okay. All right, so I wanted to share just a, a couple of things. Um, I talked a lot about board diversity. Uh, and I don't like leaving without giving people tangible action that they can go and take. Um, so I want to give the names of a couple organizations that focus on board diversity in case you weren't sure where to start. Uh, number one, Board Diversity Action Alliance, BBAA, Board Diversity Action Alliance, 
Their whole goal is to increase work representation on boards of directors here in the States. Uh, second, Alliance for Board Diversity, very same, uh, or very similar goal, but they're predominantly focused on women um, and ethnic uh, uh, minorities uh, on corporate boards. The board challenge, again, improving representation um, by challenging companies to take a pledge to appoint at least one director uh, on their board from a diverse background, uh, board list, and then the board source. Um, so again, I, I would encourage you to at least look up these organizations, see what they're all about, and then see if that's something that your company might be interested in getting involved in. Uh, the, the second thing that I'll share in the takeaway, if you haven't heard of it before, there's a company, a, a, a co coalition called CEO Action. Who's heard of CEO Action? I didn't tell you guys about CEO Action. Okay, so CEO Action came out of um, uh, really a, a commitment by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, at, at the time, it started with I think about 100 different CEOs uh, nationally who said, we're going to commit to driving diversity and inclusion in our, in our organization. Now, I think they have over 3,000 um, CEOs who have really raised the flag and said, look, we want help. We need resources, and that's the whole point of this. They have a website which, if you sign up as a, as a company, you get access to all their resources for free that walk you through any aspect of what you want to do on your diversity and inclusion journey. You can find ready made resources, PowerPoints, Excel templates, and all of that is there for you to access. They also have meetings regionally and nationally where you can talk to other CEOs about what they're doing in their organization. There's a ton of commercial real estate, uh, uh, larger commercial real estate people on that list. So I would imagine that that would be beneficial. Um, and then uh, who has heard of the LEAP program? Okay. All right. So this is something that I uh, found out about through talking with um, one of my, my friends here in the area, Terrence Payton. Uh, it's the Real Estate Associate Program. It's essentially a pipeline program to help people get exposure and access to careers in, um, it could be in, in commercial real estate, it could be in residential, but it's truly, I, I wish I had known about it when I was younger, I might have even considered it. It's truly changing some of the landscape by providing people who typically would not think about real estate as a career, access and opportunity. Um, and so I would encourage you, it sounds like most of you have heard of it, to check out the REAP program and see if that's something that you would want to share with others, um, because those might be your future employees. So I'm going to stop there. If there's no other questions, I'll turn it back over to you, or to, excuse me, Michael. And I want to say thank you again for allowing me to come and speak with you. Um, if you have any questions in the future, if there was something you didn't want to ask in front of the group, um, I'm more than happy to talk with you. That's what I do all day long is talk to companies about this topic. Uh, again, my name is Jerry Fitzpatrick, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm sure that you, Michael Jeff will be happy to share my information as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for leading this important conversation. This is very Informative for us in the room, and we're certainly leaving here more knowledgeable than when you arrive. I would also like to thank Warren USA again for their support in sponsoring this event. Thanks for coming out to this event, everyone. Don't forget, there is no lunch in next month. So I'll see all of you at the annual Bring Your Team Luncheon in a couple of months on August 17th. Stay tuned for more details. Until I have a chance to speak with you again, I'll see you around like a donut. <laughs> 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 <laughs>